Good evening and welcome. We're uh, delighted that you could join us here for uh, Darwin 200, Evolution and the Ethical Brain. My name is Gary Rosen and I'm the Chief External Affairs Officer at the Templeton Foundation. Tonight's event is just the first of many activities we have planned to mark and celebrate the great Darwin anniversary year. In April, we will hold a conference in Istanbul to consider how evolutionary theory can best be presented in the Islamic world, where, as in the US, it is often fiercely resisted. In May, we will launch an advertorial campaign online and in print asking how well evolution explains human nature with essays by a dozen prominent scientists. In the UK, our partners at the Darwin Correspondence Project are continuing their ambitious program of online publication, making Darwin's thousands of letters available to the world. And our friends at the Faraday Institute at Cambridge University will play a key role in the Darwin festivities that will be held there this summer. Finally, in the fall, we look forward to announcing what will be one of the largest grants in the Foundation's history for a multi-year program of research on the deepest questions in evolutionary biology. Tonight's discussion is our starting point, and it is an excellent entryway into Darwin's legacy. For much of the past century, Darwin's ideas were thought to illuminate only the darker side of human nature, our most violent and self-serving impulses. But over the last several generations, the best evolutionary thinking has turned in a different direction, toward more attractive and socially uh, constructive qualities that are a no less abiding part of our evolved natures. The long story of our genetic and cultural development points, it would seem, not just to our familiar brutishness, but also to altruism and cooperation, even to a sense of justice and transcendence. But how did this happen, and why, and to what end? And if evolution has somehow given us this ethical potential, how might we best use and develop it? These are the questions for our distinguished panel tonight and for our moderator, David Brooks. Uh, introducing David is a daunting task, but uh, not for the reasons you might think. There are, of course, his many accomplishments as a writer and commentator. He is smart and funny, sharp without being cruel, principled without being preachy or polemical. He manages to pull off the neat trick of being both supremely self-assured and disarmingly modest, even self-effacing. Uh, most impressive of all, and this is rare in his line of work, you can't always predict where David will come down on an issue. Readers sometimes have no choice but to conclude that he is actually trying to think things through. <laughs> Among the Jewish grandmothers who are regular viewers of the News Hour on PBS, David is universally considered a very nice boy. <laughs> and he is, by consensus, the most talented of the New York Times columnists on the right and the center right <laughs> and in the mushy middle. Why then is introducing David so daunting? Because he's watching us and he's taking notes. He looks at American society and sees tribes and status networks taboos and totems. He is an amateur anthropologist, a comic sociologist, an evolutionary biologist with attitude and a press pass. David is an especially unsparing observer of people like us and like himself. He knows our peculiar folk ways. He rummages through our pantries and closets and offices and finds little clues, little clues about our anxieties and mental habits. He understands the ritual and liturgy of the health club, the seminar room, the suburban backyard, and the Sunday brunch table with its recitations from sacred texts like the Week in Review and the Sunday Magazine. And he has studied us in certain crucial micro-environments. A few years ago, in fact, in reviewing a book about the world of public intellectuals, he even wrote about an event just like this, describing what he called, and I quote, the serial posturings of your average panel discussion. <laughs> posturings. 
These included, David went on to say, and I quote again, the flattering references of the panelists to one another's work, the pompous pose of cogitation they adopt as they pretend to listen to each other, and worst of all, perhaps, the sycophantic introductions. <laughs> so please don't feel obligated to accept my praise of David, discount it accordingly, but be assured that in my experience, he is an adequate moderator, sometimes a fully competent one. So let's hope for the best. David Brooks. Thank you, thank you Gary, for that uh, introduction. The um, panel discussion will be somewhat shorter than the introduction. Uh, no, that was very fulsome, and now I'm going to seem very uh, small, because with you guys, I just have your bios. Uh, first, let me welcome uh, those of you I feel on behalf of the New York Times, welcome to the building to which we temporarily hold the mortgage. Um, uh, may not last long, but uh, we're here, and I'm particularly thrilled to be here. In my line of work, I don't get to do stuff, but I get to be around uh, famous people. And in the last 36 hours, I've had this whirlwind period where literally within the last 36 hours, I've had meetings with President Obama, uh, Gordon Brown, Ben Bernanke, uh, a guy named Peter Orzag, who's the budget director, who actually runs the government. Uh, and uh, it's been a whirlwind period, but I'm literally I'm more thrilled to be with these gentlemen uh, than with those losers. Um, uh -oh. uh, because as someone who covers Trouble. politics, I'm under the illusion that these guys actually know what they're talking about. Uh, and I'm also of the belief uh, that what the work they're doing, the work Barack Obama's doing is tremendously important, but the work that is being done now in understanding human nature is the sort of stuff that really will have an effect for decades and centuries as we get a better understanding of human nature. And I've been dragged a little into this world uh, because a couple uh, months ago, a colleague of mine won a Nobel Prize and I didn't have one. Uh, and <laughs> I thought I would discover how consciousness emerges from the brain, and I've been at it for a couple weeks now. Um, now, I, I've, been drawn, I, I've been drawn into this because I was writing about why social policies kept producing disappointing results. And very often the answer was that because policymakers and frankly economists and a lot of social scientists had an inaccurate view of human nature. And when you get into their world, these gentlemen inhabit, they have a much more illuminating and an ac an accurate view of human nature. And what I've been trying to do in this book I'm working on is try to bring a little of their world into my world. Uh, and so we're privileged, first of all, thrilled to be with them, but we're privileged to have three not only uh, esteemed scientists and researchers, but extremely eloquent writers and speakers, which should cause us to distrust them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Michael Gazaniga is a true giant in this field. He is professor of psychology and the director of the Sage Center of the Study of the Mind at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He served on the President's Council on Bioethics. I believe you're working on something in law and neuroscience. And he's also the author of many extremely readable books and accessible books, to, the most recent of which is called Human. It's, a, it's about how uh, humans are different from animals, what makes us human. Uh, Jonathan uh, Haidt is Associate Professor of Social Psychology at the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia, which is a lot of psychologies. Uh, he writes voluminously about many subjects, including politics and religion. His book, The Happiness Hypothesis, uh, changed my life, uh, and I highly recommend that. At the far end, Stephen Kortz is an Associate Professor of Philosophy, which is worth noting, at Caltech University. He's also director of the Brain, Mind, and Science PhD program, which is part of the Social Science and Computation and Neural Systems PhD program at Caltech. He is also author of a very accessible uh, book for those of us not in the field called Liars, Lovers, and Heroes. 